Yona Koto and no my Hairamai to tonight's webinar. My name is Katie McCulloch, I'm a nurse practitioner. Tonight's webinar is a part series of webinars commissioned by Tafatu Order to support primary care. There are three sections to tonight's webinar, and at the end of each time, there will be an at each speaker's time, there will be an opportunity to have a five-minute QA with the speaker. Tonight's webinar will cover hand and finger injuries, chronic back pain, and clinical updates with Dr. Sue Tutty and Dr. Luke Luck. Tonight's speakers include Guy Melrose. Guy is an urgent care physician who works clinically in Tauranga. He is the Director of Professional Development for the Royal New Zealand College of Urgent Care and a Professional Teaching Fellow at the University of Auckland within both the Department of General Practice and Primary Care and the Department of Anesthesiology. Peter, Dr. Peter Gao. Peter has recently retired from clinical duties as the Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine and Senior Rheumatologist at Te Ora County's Manukau, though he remains active in clinical research and teaching as an honorary senior medical officer. He has been involved in the development of health pathways for many years and has an interest in chronic pain, including back pain. And our standing segment of clinical updates covered by Drs. Sue Tutty and Dr. Luke Luck, who are general practitioner liaisons. Over to you, Guy. So kia ora koutou. Um, as Katie said, I'm uh, Guy Melrose and I'm an urgent care physician. And when Katie and Luke approached me to talk about uh, some topics related to urgent care, but relating also to general practice, I thought about what could be relevant to those of you working purely in general practice, but also that might be relevant to those that do some after hours through urgent care. So I came up with this um, talk on four hand and finger injuries that I hope will be useful. So the objectives tonight, uh, to cover the basics of these four hand and finger injuries. I'm by no means an expert. I'm not a hand surgeon. What my role is in, in primary care is to assess injuries and work out which ones need to be seen by a specialist. And so I subscribe to a philosophy similar to that in the, uh, in the way that you train airline pilots. They don't have to know everything. They have to have certain memory items that they, that they know for their day-to-day activities and for emergencies and then they need to know where to look things up within their quick reference guides and know who to call for help and so um, hopefully what we'll go through here are some um, of the basics so that you know when to recognize these things and to trigger the correct pathway because all of these conditions are missed in primary care not just by um, GPs they're missed by urgent care physicians they're missed by emergency department uh, physicians as well. Um, so I'm hoping to highlight the key flags that we need to look for and just provide a, a little uh, summary slide at the end of each uh, topic. So to crack on, uh, the flexor tendon pyogenic tenosynovitis is my first um, my first hand injury infection. And this, this is an infection of the synovial sheath of the flexor tendon of the finger or thumb. And it's usually caused by a penetrating injury to the finger that's often perceived as minor by the patient. So maybe a rose thorn or something like that. It can be caused by exogenous spread from elsewhere, but th this type of um, penetrating wound is probably the most likely that we would see in urgent care, but they're quite likely to present through GP because they, they develop the infection over the coming days and even weeks. And I link in my references to a paper from the British Journal of General Practice in 2019 that um, is a case discussion exactly like this, which is worth reading because it shows the relevance to, to your work in, in general practice. So in general, they, they look like you'd expect, maybe a bit red, a bit swollen, a bit painful, and possibly a small puncture wound. And this is why they're probably quite, um, quite a dangerous uh, condition to uh, maybe brush over and think that well, it just looks infected, so I'm going to give some oral antibiotics and send you home. Or if it's a little bit worse, you may think, well, I'll send you into an urgent care for some IV antibiotics, potentially. The problem is that these don't do very well unless they're washed out by a surgeon. Uh, the tendon sheath needs to be opened up and irrigated, and then, then they have antibiotics after that. So these need to be referred to a hand surgeon as soon as possible. Now, as I mentioned in the previous slide, red finger bit painful puncture wound uh, we need to, to know when this is a flexor tendon pyogenic tenosynovitis and when it's another type of infection that you might be able to treat in the community so we're lucky in that in order to make this diagnosis we've got uh, canaval's sign 
Canaveral was an American surgeon and wrote about uh, Canaveral sign in 1912. And it enables us to make a very quick and uh, definitive diagnosis that the hand surgeons will accept. So the four parts of Canaveral's sign, the four features that make up the one sign, are a flexed posture to the digit. So when you look at the finger in at the hand in the, the resting phase, that the, the, the finger looks a little bit more flexed. There's tenderness along the flexor tendon sheath. There's marked pain when you passively extend the, the, the finger, and they have a fusiform swelling of the finger. Fusiform, as I understand it, is a bit like a sausage, so it's kind of fatter at one end and tapers to, to the ends. And so if you have those four signs, refer to a hand surgeon, and um, there is no benefit to referring them into an urgent care because they, they need to see the surgeon. And if you say canaveral sign, then the surgeon should just say yes. So it should be an easy referral. So to sum up this particular one, when should you be thinking of it? Think of it whenever you see an infected looking finger, especially a day or two after a puncture wound to the, to the volar aspect of the finger. And what do you need to, to look for to diagnose? Do canaveral sign. Um, and if you, like me, tend to forget things, um, looking them up is quite easy or having a quick reference check to check the four signs. Um, but then if they're there, you refer urgently on to a hand surgeon. And, and I think it's worth mentioning here that there are occasions when you're, we live in that gray area between something that might be going in one direction uh, rather than improving. And it might be that some of these signs are not classic. And what I'd urge you in those situations to consider is, uh, is um, for example, if, if it isn't that swollen, but there is pain on passive extension and there's tenderness along the tendon sheath that it's probably worth phoning the, the on-call hand surgeon if two or three of Canaveral's sign criteria are there because early referral is much better than than late referral and the main thing to do is don't send this person home on oral antibiotics or refer for IVs um, because if if they've got that Canaveral sign they need to see the surgeon. So the next, the next one to um, talk about is the reverse bite injury that's sometimes called the fight bite or the um, tooth knuckle injury or closed fist injury. As the name suggests, um, it's usually caused to a person who's doing the punching by the person being punched and it's their teeth that go into that closed fist. And when the fist is closed, the space between the skin and the tendon and the joints of the metacarpophalangeal joint region uh, are not very far from the surface. And so a nice dirty mouth from a, a human with all those bugs that we know are in there uh, deliver these bugs into those delicate tissues quite readily. And because alcohol is often involved on a, on a Saturday night, um, these may present late. So they may be somebody who books in to see their general practitioner later in the week. Um, as with the first case, they may be the sort of thing that is a whilst I'm here, they had an appointment to see them to see about something else and it might be a whilst I'm here. Um, but uh, yeah, they do tend to have a tendency to present late. And if they're early, then there's a little bit of swelling and you will see a wound over the metacarpophalangeal joint region. Later on, they start to get red, hot, swollen. The wound tends to sort of heal over and um, the fingers become harder to move. Uh, definitely, they, they tend to be more fixed in a flexed position, less happy to extend. And obviously, you've got to consider if there is that underlying boxes fracture associated uh, alongside it. Um, and in these situations, you might be tempted if you see them in a, in a general practice setting to give them oral antibiotics if it's looking infected. Or you might think, well, it needs an x-ray for a boxer's fracture that's sent to urgent care. If you're in urgent care, you might be thinking of IV antibiotics and giving it a clean out. And you might um, refer them down for that as well. But um, once the sort of fight bite has been established from the history, then really it's a case of phoning the surgeon and um, because they need to wash it out. You might have a role of giving them updating their tetanus, making sure they've had analgesia and they may recommend starting antibiotics. And um, if you do have x-ray available, then it's perfectly reasonable to x-ray. But I think if somebody's got a nice meaty fight bite wound that's going into that joint or tendon, and I'm referring them on that basis, where I work, there's a $50 surcharge for x-rays. So it seems a bit unfair to, to insist on that when the referral's going to happen anyway, but um, you could do those things. 
so you think about this in someone who's punched somebody when there's a wound over the dorsum of the metacarpophalangeal joint that is more than superficial because obviously if it's just a skin scrape and the skin is is only superficially injured then then you can confirm there's nothing going deeper however um if it looks like it goes through the skin the um, ability to define how deep these go is quite difficult particularly when the um, fist is fully clenched those tissues are nice and tight and then when they open up again a bit like swiss cheese all the holes don't line up and so it can be very difficult to determine um, with certainty that they don't go into that joint so uh, and if there's infection there if they're seeing you late then then the game's over if there's infection there then then you're referring based on that straight to the hand surgeon and um uh, oral antibiotics and home are not are not an option. Don't don't be tempted to do that. If you say to a surgeon there's an infected fight bite, they 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 won't make any any pushback on that. Um, I'll mention regarding the depth of wound um, a little bit more when I talk about the next case, um, the next condition, I should say, um, central slip rupture. Um, so the central slip is part of the extensor mechanism of the finger um, and it extends the PIPJ and it inserts into the, the middle phalanx. And it can be injured through trauma, um, either rupturing the tendon or uh, avulsing the insertion, or it can be lacerated through an open wound. Um, it can also be a consequence of, of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it, these present with boutonnier deformities in the later stages. So. Um, it's worth uh, obviously remembering that association between them. But just for this presentation, I'm just thinking of the, the my experience through an urgent care um, clinic, and that is those associated with the wound and those associated with the closed injury. Um, so if someone's had closed trauma, if they're a farmer and they, they carried on and a few months later come in and see you and they've got that boutonnier deformity, you might see that. But if it's more acute, then uh, they'll have tenderness to that PIPJ. Um, and it's perfectly reasonable for these sorts of cases to, if you haven't got access to x-ray, to refer them in um, for an x-ray, because what we're looking for is that um, that uh, avulsion fracture there um, on that middle phalanx. And I guess it, it depends on how comfortable and experienced you are, but it, once you've identified a fracture, the size of the fragment and any displacement will determine if a surgeon needs to repair that and um, and so speaking with a surgeon is, is, is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, if it's not going to be repaired, then they conservatively manage them in extension through hand, hand physio. Um, but one of the key things with this injury is to make sure that the, the central slip function is, is intact, which we'll talk about in a moment, because an open wound is the other way that you might damage this. And uh, you should be thinking of the central slip when there's a wound over the, the, the PIPJ, but in general, any wound to the hand, uh, tendon injuries are surprisingly sneaky. And I've linked to three papers in the references at the end that, um, that, that highlight that we're not very good when we explore hands in a non-surgical setting at determining the depth and the extent of tendon injuries. Um, one study, I think it was as much as 30% were missed in ED, and another study actually used hand uh, fellows to explore a wound in an ED setting before then doing it in a, a more surgical setting, and they missed things in the ED setting that they then found in the surgical setting. So the limitations of examining these in a clinic environment um, is there, and there is a real risk that we miss them. And so a thorough exam is, is useful, but you've got to use your sort of um, clinical nous a little bit. And if there's any concern that you think that a wound is extending to any tendon in the hand, my personal practice is to have a chat to the surgeon because the consequences of missing these can be much more significant. And when it comes to the, um, the uh, central slip, the reason, excuse my rather crude drawing here, but it, it, I think it explains things at least it does through the way my brain works, is um, the central slip there attaching into the middle phalanx extends that middle phalanx. And the lateral bands go sort of down and around the sides and then in insert into the distal phalanx there. So if you rupture the central slip, as you can see in the bottom picture, the lateral bands can actually do some extending of the finger. Um, it can sort of yank everything back and engage. And so if you do a cursory exam of somebody who's got a small wound in that area and think that their finger is moving, 
that cursory exam might miss a central slip because you're being tricked because there's movement and that movement is because of these, these lateral bands. So to determine whether a central slip is, is intact through either closed or open um, methods, then uh, Elson's test is the, 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 the key thing that we need to take from this talk. Um, an orthopedic surgeon who wrote about this in 1986, he described the standard test now, but there's also a modified version. And um, the standard version on the left there, uh, you get the patient to flex the, um, the proximal interphalangeal joint over a desk, uh, the side of a table, and extend, ask them to extend the finger. And then you put pressure where that push button is to resist it. And you should feel a good solid resistance because the uh, central slip is intact. On top of that, because the central slip is intact, the lateral bands won't be called upon. So when you flick the uh, distal phalanx, you'll find it's all floppy and, uh, and loose. So that will tell you that the central slip is intact and you can move on. If the central slip is damaged, that extension is not going to be as powerful. But when you flick the distal phalanx, you'll find it's quite rigid. And that's because the central, um, the, the lateral bands, sorry, are engaging and uh, are, are pulling that distal phalanx tight. Uh, the modified version on the right, um, you make a heart sign like that, and the fingers, the distal phalanxes should look um, symmetrical. And if they don't look symmetrical, then that's, then that's a kind of a concern. And also the, the patient shouldn't be able to then extend those distal phalanxes because they're, um, if the central slips intact, then the, the lateral bands won't be, won't be, um, won't be working. Um, I have to thank Dave Sorrell, our director of clinical training, for being the hand model for my pictures there. Just going back to that picture, you can see there on the bottom one, the lateral bands, they, they, you can appreciate then if they engage, why that, that distal phalanx is going to become solid uh, when, uh, when the person's trying to extend that middle phalanx in the presence of a central slip. So in a closed injury, uh, ball to finger, force flexion, um, you start thinking of it when they've got pain in that PIPJ. Um, and if they can't extend it, then uh, obviously Elson's test will, will confirm that the central slip is gone. If it's a later thing, you'll see the boutonnier deformity. But um, yeah, an, an x-ray is an important thing to do to look for those avulsions. Speak with the hand surgeon if, if there's um, a positive Elson's test or if the avulsion is, is significant. Uh, or the fracture is significant, um, and otherwise splinting is 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 the the treatment. Um, so there is a connection there between uh, general practice and urgent care can probably manage these between between us, um, if in in certain circumstances. But the key thing is don't forget to to check that integrity and don't trust generalized extension. Any movement you need to isolate those um, that central slip. And that's the same for the, the wound over the dorsum of the PIPJ. As I say, it doesn't have to be very big. Um, it, it just has to be deep enough. And um, if, if it goes more than superficial, just be suspicious. Do the Elson's test and refer. And um, yeah, the assumption of a minor wound, as I say, those papers um, linked at the end were, were an eye opener to me. And um, I think we, we have an obligation to realize that we're not hand surgeons we're not we're not surgeons and we have to know where our boundaries are and, and in that gray area we have to i think err in the side of um uh, the patient rather than uh, take any risks the final fracture is that i want or the final injury i want to mention is the seymour fracture a scottish orthopedic surgeon in 1966 described these kiddies fractures and it's for kids who've got um uh, patent physis and their their um uh, phalanxes because it's a fracture of the distal phalanx physis with an associated nail bed injury. Um, they can present as a mallet deformity and it's easy to confuse them with a mallet finger, um, which is one take home from this. A kid with a mallet finger, you've got to be thinking Seymour fracture um, and be very happy that it, that it isn't a Seymour. Um, what the problem with the Seymour fracture is that because the nail bed gets injured, the tissue can become interposed into the physis. Mm -hmm. And if it stays there, it, it prevents healing. And if it prevents healing, then you have problems. It's hard to determine without proper exploration if it is in there. There's no test really that, that, that I know of, at least, that can tell you if it's in there or not. So um, if you miss it, kids will end up with nail plate deformities, physis arrest, and chronic osteomyelitis. So it, it's one of those ones, again, where you don't want to miss it. Again, my nice crude drawing I apologize for, but I think this represents a 
distal phalanx um, vital fracture there, um, slightly widened, you'd appreciate on, on the dorsal side there. So there probably is going to be a little bit of a mallet finger to this kitty. The nail plate has has has, the, has come out of the epinicheal fold, and there's a, a, a laceration through the the, uh, the nail um, the nail bed, and the tissue has gone into that physal plate. So that's kind of a representation of why we need to be thinking of these things. And when you look at fractures like this um, on the X-ray, that's quite an obvious um, Seymour fracture. You're, you're certainly not going to miss that, and that would look clinically quite deformed. And the reason I put this slide in is I think there is a, a maybe a, a potential to think, should you reduce that, um, a ring block and a bit of gas, and you could probably reduce that to a bit straighter. But the problem is if, if, if there's the nail bed injury, that needs to be repaired and all the tissue needs to be removed from, from the physis. So I would be talking to a surgeon that I wouldn't be tempted to, to give that a straighten. But the reason I think that these get mismanaged, um, and this is taken from the Royal uh, Children's Hospital of Melbourne uh, clinical practice guidelines, they um, this this picture I think to me is is why we maybe miss these. And the associated X-ray that's on their um, CPG doesn't look that impressive. It's just a, a very slight widening in the dorsal part of the diaphysis, and then um, the. A quick cursory look at this, you might think, oh, then I can see the nail fold and I can see the nail is, is still there. It's just a little bit a bit injured and maybe clean that up. And um, and actually, this is a this is a, um, a, a Seymour fracture. So I think the this is the gray area where these get missed, not the obvious malleted ones like the previous X-ray. It's in this sort of gray area. So um, so when to, when to consider with these any child with who, who's still got. Um, open phalangeal physis can get a, a, a um, Seymour fracture. So if they've had a crush injury or an injury to the fingertip that uh, involves the nail bed, you should be thinking of, of it. And um, what we should look for is a possible mallet deformity and, and obviously the disruption to the nail bed or a wound. Um, as that picture showed, it didn't look obvious that it, that the um, that the nail bed was in, was necessarily injured. It could you could think it's quite superficial without having a proper look. And particularly in kids who might be crying and in pain and difficult to examine, um, so an X-ray is, is is certainly worth doing. And but I've put that unless an obvious deformity, because I think in general practice, if you were to see this, um, and the the child had an obvious mallet deformity with a uh, with a nail, I would probably call the, the hospital direct and say that it looks like a a Seymour fracture. I think the benefit of sending that to an urgent care is an extra step that probably um, isn't isn't needed if you if if it really does look um uh, look malleted but in that picture you might want an x-ray to help kind of work out if the if the, the bone is involved if that vice vice is in, involved um and yeah, if any doubt finding the surgeon is is the better option um rather than taking a risk uh, so don't ignore subungual hematomas, partial evulsions, and never assume it's a mallet finger in kids if the nail's involved. And yeah, if you're tempted to straighten that, I would speak to a surgeon first before touching before touching that. Um, so quick summary: these are four injuries that can be really obvious, but they can be really subtle, and it's in the subtle sort of grey area that these things get missed. But these little simple discriminators I've just talked about enable you to, to diagnose them, but it, it also enables a very quick disposal to the hand surgeon, because if you say this person's got a finger infection with canaval sign present, it's a quick referral. Um, if you say the words a reverse bite wound overlying the metacarpophalangeal joint, plus or minus infection, that's an easy refer. Elson's positive in the presence of a dorsal PIPJ wound or, or trauma, again, um, fairly easy refer. And a nail bed injury, in a and when with any suspicion of physial involvement in a kitty, it's worth getting on the phone to the surgeons. Um, quick mention here that the college uh, podcast that I produce, um, one that we've been running for five years, covers things like this. We try and do um, break things down quickly and easily and make it um, simple so that if I can understand it, then I think anybody could understand it. But these are my um, kind of recommended reading or references. The author bullets pages are, are great. Um, the paper there by Chan 
et al. and the British Journal of General Practice is open access, and that's um, that that shows a cautionary tale of of a flexor tendon sheath that was referred through general practice, um, but it's a good example of of why that might come through. You guys, um, academic life and emergency medicine have a great video on the Elson's test if you want to see that um, in in action. And then those three papers were really ones I, I found that made me reconsider my ability to diagnose uh, or confirm a tendon injury. And so in, in the hands in particular, if patients have pain when they're moving their finger, when you're, when you're getting them to, um, when, 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 when you're stressing them, doing a stress test on either their flexion or extension and they're getting pain and the wound looks quite deep, then I'm often speaking to a surgeon because I can't trust my exploratory skills because, I, as I said, hand fellows can't be trusted either, it would seem. Um, and then Radiopedia at the end is a great resource. And they provided those x-rays. So I think that's that's me. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Guy. I really appreciate it. So we've got some time for q and if uh, you'd like to bring forward any questions you have for Guy. Um, first question, just straight off the bat, uh, how big a fracture fragment is considered significant enough for surgery in a central uh -huh. rupture? So I couldn't find an obvious answer about the size. It definitely said any displacement needs to be needs to be um, uh, repaired. And so, if there's any concern about displacement, then that then that's a definite trigger. The reason I that's why I put in it's probably worth running it past a surgeon, um, or at least the X-ray past the surgeon is. Uh, there are some, and I, I think with um, distal phalangeal um, uh, fractures, there's I think thirty percent of the joint, uh, and 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 this, these sort of percentages that are batted around. But um, yeah, I, I I tend to um, err on the side of caution and check with the local service to make sure that they're happy, because yeah. um, two minutes for them to check the X-ray just prevents you from um, you know delaying treatment for them. So yeah, any displacement definitely. And that one on that x-ray didn't look that big to me. So I'd probably be thinking that's going to be conservatively managed, but um, yeah, I, I tend to let them make that call. Yeah, I think it's really important to reach out to those resources that we have. Mm. And I guess particularly with with um, the advice that you've given us, being able to use those, uh, you know, I just want to rule this out so that there isn't any ongoing mm. um, long-term. You know, I think that the, the problem these days is that we've, I mean, for as long as I can remember, there's been a narrative about how primary care needs to be preventing referrals to hospital. Mm -hmm. But when I when I think of us as the sieve of five million people, our job is to keep all those five million plates spinning and to try and refer those that are necessary into the hospital. But preventing referrals to a busy hospital is, is all well and good. But if the person needs to be in hospital, then they need to be in hospital. And so... Um, I, I tend to try and think of what if that was my family member, you know, I, 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 if, if there's any doubt that there could be a negative outcome, um, I, I have to say I'm not an expert. I'm not the, I, I'm, I think in urgent care, we're, we're expert in knowing, dealing in those gray areas and, and primary care is in general, general practices in the same. It's, it's about uh, dealing with those uncertainties and uh, recognizing where, our expertise stops and where we have to pass that on and sometimes it's it's where, where you feel comfortable and where your experience is but if you haven't seen one of these for a while I often phone just to say you know is this okay because it's it may be a couple of years since you've seen it and, and things change like practice guidelines change treatments change so you can't keep abreast of everything so um, I always favour just a, a quick call or a quick a quick check or, or um, you know speak to a friend, a colleague, a hospital, check the books. Um, as I say, that kind of airline analogy for me is when I when I recognise something like that, like one of these sort of conditions, um, I then maybe just need to go a little bit deeper to to check that that um, the, some of the more deeper specifics, because you can't maintain all that knowledge all the time. We're very lucky with our colleagues um, in tertiary care and secondary mm. care that will, that will be there for us and support mm. us with those questions. So I think that's really um, mm. important to reach out. And the key thing is to ask the ask the right question, ask it succinctly, provide all the information that they need so that they can make that decision. It's important not to to phone up and waffle and or, or to phone up and and be vague. You know, if you if you ring up and say, "Look, I'm concerned 
that this central slip um, insertion has uh, there's an avulsion fracture there. I'm I'm just concerned. Is that is that acceptable, or would you guys like to see it because it it, it, it might need surgery? And they mm -hmm. can say, look at the X-ray and say, fine. And you can say to them, you know, they they they've got extension. Elson's test is is intact, is, is negative. So, you know, it, I think it's important when you do phone them that you that you wrap up the the question neatly and and um, succinctly. Does intraarticular extension always mean that we should speak to a hand surgeon when it comes to a phalangeal injury? Again, similar to the previous answer, and, and I'm probably an overly cautious person. I think one of the problems I've personally found, the more I've got into producing kind of CPD and presenting things like this and teaching at the university, the more I guess I've learned that I've reflect back on previous years and think oh god did i miss this or did i miss that did i and so um i think the more you learn the more you realize of how much there is that could go wrong and so maybe i'm as i acknowledge i'm probably more cautious than, than some people um but yeah it, it, in a in a young person whose fingers are important to them you, you want to make sure that on day one you're giving them the right the right uh, foot forward so in anything intra-articular always um i think it, it concerns me a little bit more just in case you know that, that something could go wrong and um yeah so i, I tend to, i tend to personally use intra-articular injuries as a, as a kind of uh my my little red line to, to cross over and and if not referred at least check um locally with local policies or local surgeons or ensure follow-up is within an, a nice time frame that any anything could be picked up so just raises that caution level that threat level a little bit for me and if you didn't have access to a hand surgeon for whatever reason you couldn't get mm. all of them do you think um referring to a hand therapist would be useful or if you kind of yeah yeah, yeah. And, if, and to be honest with you hand therapists manage these and know more about these than than anybody the hand surgeons are the hand therapists i've met over the years are uh, are outstanding at this and so um one thing that would be um recommended certainly to any all urgent care doctors should make friends with their local hand therapist and try and engage in some cpd with them try and do some sessions with them watch them splinting watch them examining and and, and all that um mm -hmm. and shared care in the community between us as a team is is definitely the way forward and um sometimes yeah you need to speak with the surgeon to say do you want to operate on this and if they say no then my default is always hand therapy follow-up for for all hand injuries um, if they're available they're not available in all areas but um i'm aware that they do do telehealth um the, the more remote places physios without hand physio training i think do connect their telehealth with with some hand physios and i think the the the, the, the reach is getting in is improving but yeah, yeah in the cities you should be able to to get them and, and they're great and i i mm. um should all nail possible nail bed damage be referred would you say so the concern that the seymour concern is that nail bed injury with physial involvement so um most nail injuries in adults can be repaired um in a in a in a community setting um potentially and um yeah i just would have that caution around a kid who's got any concern of that physical involvement mm -hmm. uh the the ability for me to say there's no um tissue in there particularly the younger they get like an adult you can ring block and and spend all day fiddling around with their nail bed but in a kiddie it's it's much harder in the community to 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 do that so um I think it's the the association between nail bed injury and possible um, Salter Harris in fracture of the of that um, distal phalanx that is the is the key take home here. Mm. But, um, and, and there are papers now that kind of have questioned: Do nail beds need to be sutured versus glued versus um, left splintered with with the nail uh, reimplanted? And um, yeah, there's there's a sort of a I'm trying to get my head around the latest ways to manage nail bed injuries, certainly. But um, yeah, that's an interesting one to keep an eye on in the future. But 
Yeah, Seymour's is, is, is the fracture with the nail bed injury. Just on the nail bed repair, someone's just asked, is it when when is a nail bed repair indicated? Is it based on more than 50% nail bed discoloration? What what's your so the nail beds that are easiest to repair are the ones that have totally avulsed the nail mm. because that's that or that that's the easy part. Um when to remove the nail, I think is where it gets interesting now because if the nail is mostly um intact. Mm -hmm. then it's providing splinting and 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 so um yeah i'm i'm to be honest with you i'm i, I as i mentioned before i'm relatively cautious with things anyway but i would be um i'd be looking at the latest literature to try and determine what the the current because a, a lot of things in medicine we end up doing things that we've done for 20 years and then some new recommendation comes out and it takes another 20 years for that to kind of seemingly become mainstream because we all just keep doing what we did before. And so, um, yeah, the, the idea of totally removing a nail and, and suturing the, the nail bed shut and replacing the nail, um, that, that does seem to be, that there seems to be arguments against that. But um, off the top of my head and without preparing, I probably can't speak to that. In, a, in an expert capacity at the moment but, um, <laughs> yeah so again i would i would probably check with um with with your uh, various resources and colleagues and 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 the like if you if you do have them because it's mm -hmm. it is it is changing um i think in the and glue is is being used much more uh, is my understanding oh, off the topic of now bed repair now um how often do you x-ray for puncture wounds um even if they're not suspicious for fracture? So, so again, the, the benefit of an x-ray in um, those sort of settings is if you're, you, you can see gas in, in the joint or, or um, uh, if, if you're suspicious of something going into the joint and you can see some foreign objects on x-ray, but they're not the best. Um, whenever you refer them, the, the hand surgeons or the orthopedic surgeons might say, can they have an x-ray on arrival? I guess, as I mentioned, there's a cost to the patient. So how often do I do an x-ray? Certainly if I think it's a radiolucent body, and mm -hmm. certainly if I think there's an involvement of the joint, then, then an x-ray is useful to look for uh, for gas in the joint. And in older injuries, older in infections, um, osteomyelitis is obviously a useful thing to do the x-ray for. But um, mm -hmm. Yeah, something like a rose thorn is, is probably not going to show on the x-ray, but I guess now POCUS is becoming more prevalent, so um, that's quite a useful thing. Although I, I saw a toe recently that um, had MRI, ultrasound, and an x-ray that didn't show the foreign object, but they found all sorts of muck in the joint on when they were explored on surgery. So, Interesting. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, it, 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 if there's other clinical factors, I'd, I'd go with those, to be honest, um, and particularly in that hand scenario, um, because if you've got that canaveral sign, it's a easy referral. It's that, that's um, regardless of how it happened. We've got to wrap up on your questions here. There is one that is very broad, so if you can give a very <laughs> succinct, what else <laughs> might you miss in a, in in GP land in terms of hand injuries? You've got thirty oh. seconds. <laughs> Certainly all the collateral ligaments of the thumb are injuries that are very important uh, not to miss. Um, I guess mismanaged, we, the proximal metacarpal fractures, um, that kind of carpo metacarpal joint, um, x-rays can not show as much displacement as there maybe is. So those often need higher imaging. So um, I don't trust x-rays once I've seen the fracture there. Um, but yeah, any tendon injury, any joint injury, um, cat bites, very, very um, have the potential to go to go bad and um, and be mis mismanaged because um, yeah, early referral, early concern for cat bite injuries. I did read a hand surgeon in America who used to advocate for all cat bites to be excised by a surgeon. And one of the papers I listed there about the the, the wounds recommended a hand surgeon explore all hand wounds which is just not practical in the real world. But we also have to not keep our patients waiting in the community before referring them for too long. So <laughs> really appreciate your time, Guy. Um, now we'll be moving on to Peter Gao. Thank you, Peter. Kia ora koutou. I was asked by Luke to talk on 
ankylosing spondylitis uh, in particular, uh, and perhaps just a few brief words about the, uh, the differential diagnosis. So I'm going to start with a case study um, of a patient who presented to my registrar in 2012, um, and then talk about uh, a general approach to the diagnosis of uh, back pain, but then focus particularly on inflammatory back pains, diagnosis, management, and differential diagnosis. And uh, in the latter, I'll just sort of briefly talk about um, uh, the red flags to be aware of and um, uh, fibromyalgia, chronic widespread pain, as it's now called. <clears throat> So this was a, a young man who uh, developed back pain after an accident. He jumped off a fence uh, a, a year before, and he saw an orthopedic surgeon who noted uh, wide base gait, uh, reduced spinal movement, a reduced straight leg raise. Um, but the MRI showed no spinal pathology. Um, when he presented to the registrar, his, his treatment was a variety of alternative and uh, homeopathic remedies. Um, and the registrar did the examination, um, the key points of which was a reduced Schober's test of, of spinal flexion. And I'll um, show you what uh, how to do that. Finger to floor was 20 centimeters. Um, the issue with finger to floor um, measurement is that if a patient has very mobile hips, you can actually touch the floor with a, with a fused um, lumbar spine. Chest expansion was normal and there was slight tenderness of the sacroiliac joint. Uh, ACC had referred the patient to the pain clinic, but the GP uh, was suspicious that this might be spondylitis and had requested an HLA B27. And when he came to the clinic, his CRP was noted to be very high. So the initial management was uh, to continue with the private physiotherapy, which he had been going to on ACC, regular anti inflammatory medication and uh, sulfasalazine, which has a low evidence base of being effective in spinal ankylosis and spondylitis, I think one trial out of nine, uh, the registrar suggests that perhaps he try that and x-ray the sacroiliac joints. Uh, the patient was concerned about any medication, so didn't start that. The naproxen in the physiotherapy was very good uh, with respect to pain, but morning stiffness lasted for several hours. The investigations, the report of a sacroiliac joint showed no significant abnormality as identified. And this is the, the X-ray which was taken. And in fact, uh, on this right side, there is a regularity of the, the margins with some sclerosis on both sides of the, of the joint. Um, and the learning points from this um, uh, case presentation is that patients uh, often can recall an injury, um, which in part enables them to be seen promptly on ACC. So they're referred to orthopedic surgeons. And the role of the orthopedic surgeon is to determine is there an orthopedic condition. Um, so an MRI of the spine is done, but uh, the sacroiliac joints aren't included in uh, the MRI. And so uh, sacroiliitis is, is often missed if you just rely on the MRI um, done by the orthopedic students. And the other thing is sacroiliitis is not uncommonly missed by um, radiologists. Um, and particularly if you don't raise that suspicion on your request form. 
So a mnemonic which I uh, learned many years ago is this, I know, please, chaps, not another back pain. Um, so, and I've, I've outlined what those particular things uh, are that one must question about, uh, particularly the nerve involvement, um, if one's looking for uh, a disc prolapse. Uh, the prevalence of which is only about 2% per year compared to uh, non-specific mechanical back pain of around 56% in a year. And ankylosing spondylitis, the, uh, the prevalence is about 2% per year um, or 5% of those who are HLA B27 positive. But it's the plus factors which are the important ones to determine the um, determine the diagnosis. So this is a definition of ankylosing spondylitis, and the key points are the sacroiliac joints, the apophyseal joints, and also the peripheral joint uh, inflammation and the tendon attachments um, or enthesitis. So why do we need an early diagnosis. I think everybody likes to know whether there's some uh, diagnosis that uh, is accessible to treatment so that you can initiate the appropriate therapy with non steroidals and physiotherapy. And if they are not uh, beneficial, then turn at alpha blocking agents. And it has a lot of morbidity um, ankylosing spondylitis and certainly prior to our current medications a lot of people were uh, unable to to work and certainly enjoy their sport and the tnf alpha blockers work better in the early stages though there's no reliable evidence that they prevent progression so the symptoms of inflammatory back pain um, which you should always ask the patient about is, um, has it been going on for more than three months? Uh, did it start when the person was uh, under the age of 45? And is the morning stiffness improvement with exercise, but not with rest? And that's, that's a critical thing. And um, ask about awakening in the, in the second half of the night. Uh, it's more specific than saying, do you, do you wake at night um, because of the pain? And the alternating buttock pain is characteristic of bilateral sacroiliitis. And if you've got two of those, then you've got uh, a sensitivity of 70% and specificity of 81%. But what it means if you do have that, then you uh, ask some additional questions and also examine more thoroughly. And these are just the overall clinical characteristics, some of which we've mentioned already. Uh, enthesitis is the where the tendons and the ligaments attach, uh, which is a differentiating feature uh, from rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, also, ask about eye inflammation and check with respect to inflammatory bowel disease and psoriasis. Don't do a rheumatoid factor. And this is the, the, the diagnostic pathway on the, um, the health pathways, which uh, I'd recommend that you all uh, review if you haven't done so already. Perhaps this will be a reminder, but uh, I wasn't involved in the development of them, but they, they're pretty clear and give a good explanation of the diagnosis and management. This is the distribution of uh, sacroiliac pain and where it is actually felt um, with the, the, the frontal view and, and the back view. And what interests me about this is that it's, uh, it could well be the same distribution for um, spinal pain due to disc degeneration or to uh, hip pain. So what is required is to do um, uh, an examination. Now, 
I find that the most specific examinations are the uh, are the, the the thrust test here, number number three, where you push down straight down through the knee and ask the patient where they feel the pain. And if it's in the sacroiliac, they'll they'll be able to lateralize it. And the the one in number four is um, the flabia test flexion. Uh, abduction and um, external rotation, and that often provokes sacroiliac pain as well. The modified Schober's test, you find the uh, the dimples of Venus at the um, sorry at the uh, posterior superior iliac spine. You go up ten centimeters uh, from that from that mark where the uh, the right index finger is and then down five centimeters and you get the patient to bend forward and it should be at uh, increased by at least five centimeters the other thing is because of the involvement of the apophyseal joints at chest expansion and certainly one of the clues is when you get a very uh, strong looking athletic person uh, who should have about six centimeters of chest expansion and you find that they're, they're down to around 2.5 centimeters. So this is a, a pathway if you have this person with the chronic back pain more than uh, three months uh, starting in youth and you're suspicious of the inflammatory the inflammatory back pain. And in those patients, an HLA B27 is very useful. Um, it's higher in European than, um, than Maori or Pacific people. Um, <clears throat> but if you have both those, those features and a strong suspicion, uh, refer to the to the rheumatologist. And with the the use of electronic referrals, it's so simple now to just sort of outline a few of the symptoms, the signs, and your investigations, um, which would include include a CRP and to um, uh, send that electronic referral. And, and we will respond and say, yes, uh, I think it's appropriate to get an X-ray. Um, the important thing about x-ray is it can take up to five to eight years before the x-rays show any abnormality. So if you have a strong suspicion, then uh, we would recommend that you um, have treatment with a, a non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug and refer for physiotherapy for, for mobilization. And there's some very good information um, booklets um, and pamphlets from both the Arthritis Foundation and uh, Health Navigator, now called Healthify, is a very rich source of patient information material on pretty well all subjects and particularly in rheumatology. And there hasn't been much change in the management of ankylosing spondylitis since these. Um, uh, ULA um, guidelines. Uh, everybody should have the non-pharmacological rehabilitation. Then the non steroids are useful for the axial disease and the peripheral disease. Um, and then sulfasalazine, more particularly for the, the peripheral disease, because none of the um, classical disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs make a difference for the um, for the spinal disease or the sacroiliac joints. Local steroids, um, I don't do um, local local steroid injections because the anti inflammatories are usually very effective, and if not, then the TNF alpha uh, antagonists. Uh, are very good. And the efficacy, 
in comparison to the treatment of mechanical back pain is very good. 70 to 80% will get a good or very good um, benefit. But about 20 to 25% don't get sufficient, sufficient benefit um, uh, to give them a, uh, a comfortable life. So going back to the... Um, um, the health pathway, uh, it, it mentions that you should sort of assess the, uh, the severity of the patients, um, sort of three to six monthly. And then if the BASDI, and I'll show you what the BASDI is, it's a subject measure of, uh, of um, disease activity. It's the Bath, named after the city in uh, the West Country, Ankylosing Spondylitis Disease Activity Index, and refer if it's greater than greater than four. Um, it has to be greater than six in order to get onto biologic therapy, but it, it means that we can uh, reassess the patient. Um, or if the conservative management with the physio and the um, anti-inflammatories aren't working, or if they're developing peripheral joint pain and stiffness. So the BASDI is a competent score um, on a 10-point visual analog scale, which includes uh, back pain, um, fatigue, um, pain in other areas of the body, including the peripheral joints. Is it tender to, to touch um, when, you, when you press on the, on the back? And then the other two factors uh, relate to the degree of um, morning stiffness, how severe is it, and how long does it last. And there are electronic measures of this, which I usually just Google and then go through it. And, and the patients um, can actually do it, do it themselves. Now, if it's more than six, um, if the patient has definite sacroiliitis and if there's a strong suspicion but the x-rays are equivocal, then that's the indication to doing an MRI because, again, you need uh, an MRI or x-ray uh, abnormality to get onto these TNF-alpha blockers. And the patients respond extremely well uh, to them. You know, they, they go from sort of limping into the... Um, into the office to cycling 20 kilometers to tell you that they're doing very well. But it's the other factor with the TNF alpha blockers is, is the, the non spinal um, features and particularly uveitis, which is not uncommon. It's related to the HLA B27. Okay, so this is just a um, to remind you of the, the red flags, the things that you should be asking about and looking at to see uh, what makes this not a, a common uh, mechanical back, back problem. And uh, the, the key things uh, relate to um, looking for any cancer histories, uh, if there's any systemic illness with immunosuppression, you're wonder, worried about infection. If it's um, unrelentingly severe, because uh, ordinary mechanical back pain should resolve within a, uh, within a few weeks. Uh, if you've got any neurological abnormalities, and particularly suspicion of spinal stenosis with um, uh, loss of buttock sensation or incontinence, and then the intravenous drug use, and we've mentioned the, the non-mechanical pain. And finally, pending the questions, um, the fibromyalgia used to be determined by the number of tender points, but they've now reclassified it as a person who presents with chronic widespread widespread pain. 
But the other, the other features about it include the fatigue, which is often related to disturbed sleep, particularly deep sleep, uh, cognitive disturbance or brain fog, depression, headache and or abdominal pain. Um, all those are features of fibromyalgia. And so when you have somebody who has ankylosing spondylitis and they're not responding well to the anti-inflammatories or to the biologics, often then we'll explore the psychosocial issues and the sleep disturbance which might be contributing to uh, a diagnosis of coincidental fibromyalgia. So in summary, um, ankylosing spondylitis patients are often missed, particularly in women, because people think of it as a men's um, uh, condition, can be diagnosed much earlier. Uh, Disease-modifying drugs don't work in the axial disease. Uh, all of them, are, all the 10F-alpha blockers, the um, adalimumab and fliximab and atanacept are all very good, but the atanacept uh, doesn't work nearly as well for the iritis and the extra articular features. Um, and uh, as I said at the beginning, if there are any concerns, an electronic referral is, will be welcomed by the rheumatology department in Auckland. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Peter. So we're going to move on to our next section now, which is clinical updates with Dr. Sue Tutty and Luke Luck. So we've got a, a few topics to talk about today. World Contraception Day and a measles case, yes, opiate prescribing, CME events and winter wellness. So I'm going to start with World Contraception Day, which is today. So I hope that you've all had conversations with your patients about contraception today. There has been a new website that has been launched and it will be a national website and it's called Protected and Proud. So Luke is just bringing that up so that you can see the website. It's a consumer facing website. So it's got quite a lot of information there on the different forms of contraception, really clearly displayed. So we do have some contraception cards that are available through counties with a QR code that goes straight to this website. It also has information on providers on the website. It's linked with HealthPoint. So if you have a practice that is providing contraception care, do make sure that your HealthPoint information is up to date so that if this website links to HealthPoint, people can see that you are what services you are providing. I think that most practices will have a way of updating their health point rather than everybody going straight to health point to do that. But I'm sure that you can organise that within your practices. There has been some change to the way that Auckland and Waitamata are funding their contraception service. So from now on, if you consider that you are a qualified to provide a LARC service, which is um, what Luke has just brought up, that if you go to Health Pathways, it will show you on the pathways for doing devices, such for doing LARC insertions, such as the Jadel or the IUC pathway, either of those. If you go under the information right down the bottom, information for health professionals and you can see there is the Ministry of Health guideline for what is considered to be the appropriate training for a person who's providing a LARC service. So if you in your professional responsibility and capacity feel that you are able to provide the service, then Auckland and Waitamata are now very happy for you to use the funding and make a claim directly through POAC to provide the service for their women if they fit the criteria. In counties, we still have our funding going through our PHOs as part of a PHO contract. So you work with your PHOs to be funded for the LARC service. And we do still require people to be signed off under this training guideline. Yes, um, thank you, Sue. I just want to bring everyone um, attention to the measles cases. 
Um, just a new update, actually. Um, there is a second case has been identified in Auckland in the last seven days um, after a recent travel abroad. Um, this case is unrelated to the first measles case um, notified last week. Um, the first case was actually in Takanini community and presented to Auckland Hospital. Um, and the one this week was in Hobsonville um, community and presented both to Love Shore and Watakiri Hospital. Um, so far this year, there has been three earlier cases of measles in Auckland this year, one in February, two in May. Um, they all linked to um, overseas travel. So what we want to remind everyone is that um, we would like to urge everyone to stay alert um, of the symptoms of measles. Um, those are fever, cough, runny nose, cough and um, pain eyes. Um, and it's important that we ensure that all the children between um, 15 months and four years to have their um, normal vaccination um, to do what we can to um, limit the um, measles cases um, spreading in the um, community. Um, second that I would like to talk about is actually um, is quite um, affecting us quite a bit. Um, it's in um, October, um, this new changes of, of the opioid prescribing. Um, so from the 5th of October 2023, um, new limit of opioid prescribing will apply. Um, this means that the maximum limit of opioid prescribing is down to one month. Um, for class B, um, it will be dispensed for 10 days, and class C, it will dispense for one month. And one thing for us to notice is that um, from October 1st, um, 2023, trauma though will be a class C opioid as well. So the maximum amount of opioid that we can prescribe for trauma though would be one month. Um, and then the um dispensary from pharmacy will be one month. Um, there are other class B um and class C long opioid, um, like benzo, sopicone, and um methylphenidate. Um, those are still three months prescription and dispensed by the pharmacy every month as well. Um, but just to be mindful that trauma dog is going to be a classic opioid for now. I just wanted to talk about some of the CME opportunities that are coming up in the next few days or weeks. One is the maternal immunisation webinar, which is on Thursday night. This is just from 6 to 6.45. Now, I was just informed today that our pertussis coverage for Maori mums in counties has dropped to 20% which um, is really somewhere that we don't want to be. And we've seen cases of whooping cough through this year. So really encourage you, if you need to brush up on your maternal immunizations, to just join that. There's an obstetric cardi cardiology symposium. I appreciate that this is on a Wednesday and that's pretty hard for primary care to get to, but you are certainly welcome to attend at Kawawatia. And there's some really good topics, rheumatic valve disease, um, heart disease and pregnancy, pitfalls with metallic heart valves when, and again, in pregnancy and acquired cardiomyopathies, which um, we've seen a few of lately that are myth related. So some topics that are of direct relevance, I think, to primary care, if you can make that one. And then we have our Mental Health and Addictions Day on Saturday, the 14th of October. This year we're doing mental health and there's some great topics there. There's the usual ones of ADHD and autism and eating disorders that we are now uh, very front of mind. But there's also some interesting ones on substance use in elderly and in pregnancy and on how to conduct a consultation, particularly with youth, to start talking about some of these issues. There's vaping and suicide prevention and a talk on chronic pain as well. So if you would like to enroll for that, that would be on the Goodfellow website. And lastly, we just wanted to mention about the winter wellness campaign that was running across the Auckland region that will finish in the 30th of September. So that was the access to acute and semi-acute x-rays, the CT scans for head injuries, and the pharmacy program that um, for the minor ailments. 
so that will all stop at the end of this month. So just letting you know about that. There's a quick one here from um, Helen Lilly just saying that she saw methadone was on the list and thought that opioid substitution treatment was still allowed to be prescribed for three months. Um, I think the um, methadone it is on the cusp of opioid, um, mm -hmm. but then the um, opioid substitute um, treatment program is actually something that extends for um, certain um, prescription that can last a bit longer. So for example, if we write that the patient is um, going on way or something, then they can last for three months as well. Um, so there is some exemption about that. I can put up a link and answer Helen's question. I just did find that on the website again. Thanks, Luke. And um, are there any funded light trainer um, programs still happening? There are. Counties runs funded light training and there is train the trainer courses that are running. Mm -hmm. um, and if people in Auckland and Waitamata want training, then they need they can still access that as well. It's just that if they feel competent to already provide the service, that, that training is no longer essential. Thank you so much. So that is um, all the questions that we have, and it comes perfectly to the, the, the time that we need to end the webinar anyway. So I just, um, I really want to thank you again, Guy and Peter and Sue and Luke for taking the time to present this evening. Uh, and thank you to everyone for joining with us tonight. Hope everyone has a lovely night. Kakite.